when is when is the, the when is the, the near, near campus, campus the following Friday, Friday Saturday, Saturday, Sunday? Yeah. Okay. April six, Thursday, uh, open house. Open house, Ebenezer Place, next April sixth, next Thursday. And that will be the last deer camp for the season. Yeah, of the deer season. It, it ends. Deer season ends next weekend. Not this weekend, but uh, nine, seven, eight days from now. Eight days from now. So if you have not been to a deer camp, uh, it's a great thing to do. I know Phil has asked about how many have been there and how many have not. If you have not done it, there's still room to sign up for the one uh, next weekend. And there's also an open house on Thursday night. You're welcome to come up, hang out around the fire pit, enjoy being on the deck from 5 30 to 9. Great. Let me open us with a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather here, Lord. Heaven, cease by our hostess. We ask blessing upon this company, Lord, and blessing upon Phil as he shares us this morning. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I grew up in a little country church in East Tennessee, Carter County, Elizabethton. And uh, I learned um, so much about what I know of God um, since I was little, little in this little country church. And it wasn't until I got to the University of Tennessee that I actually gave my heart to the Lord or, or maybe God captured my heart uh, is, is, is a better way to say that. But I learned so much about the Lord uh, by listening to uh, these old hymns. Um, our whole session this morning is, is on having an encounter with God, having an encounter of intimacy. And I want to play this country bluegrass uh, song for you by Alan Jackson um, uh, that I heard growing up in church for years. And I trust that it'll take you where it took me as a child uh, and prepare your heart for what God has for us this morning. Open your heart uh, to what God has. May you hear the voice of God.
hard not to think of my mama when I uh, hear that song. My mama loved that song. Be on the alert. Stand firm in your faith. Act like men. Be strong. The words from 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Gentlemen, I'm in a place this morning, uh, in one sense, I don't care whether you are here or not. Because I need to hear what I'm getting ready to say. Uh, in a sense, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to teach, speak, preach to myself uh, this morning because I need to have an encounter uh, with the living God. I long for it. Um, you know, there's, there is not a man in this room that is not facing and experiencing challenges and demands that seem more than what you can handle. There's nobody, nobody in here without that. Uh, because that's life works. <clears throat> I feel that this morning. Um, and I think for all of us, most of us can handle what faces us at work if the home front is stable and your health is stable. Um, you know, pain is always relative. There's always somebody worser than what you are, but I'm facing things at home, and I've had a chest and head cold for three weeks, and I'm a miserable patient. I, I'm, I whine. I sleep like a baby. I suck my thumb, cry for my mama. Uh, so Carla is miserable. When I'm miserable, uh, I don't like being sick, and, I, and I'm not a good sick person. And I, I feel attacked by the enemy. Do you feel that? Do you ever feel that? I do. I'm feeling it this morning uh, very much. So I'm glad that I'm here, and I'm glad that you're here. I want you to pick up your pen and engage with me, and let's seek God together. I want you to draw this diagram that we've drawn throughout our series on intimacy, playing field. <clears throat> I want you just to draw this simple diagram uh, rectangle, football field like um, rectangle. This is the playing field. In the first cornerstone is your spiritual life. You've got to have the God piece in place. Somehow, the Bible seems to indicate that if we get our lives straight with God, circumstances and relationship will fall into place. I believe that. That's the anchor piece. And then what we are continually directed toward, and if you want to understand what intimacy is, you've got to be self-aware. As I said to you last week, my experience in working with men for over 30 years is that we are not self-aware. We are uh, self-promoting. Um, we want things outside of ourselves, and the problem is always out there that needs to be fixed or a person that needs to get their act together because they're disrupting my life. But I don't know what's going on inside of me, but my wife sees that I'm angry or depressed. What's going on in you is critical, self-awareness. And then the third piece is this respect for other, and that requires some degree, a large degree of empathy. We have got to be strong in empathy, and empathy is the ability to put yourself in the other's shoes, that you really understand where they are. Now, keep in mind that you don't understand where they are until they give you the thumbs up that you understand. You know, if she starts talking and you say, I get it, sweetheart, I understand what you're saying. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. I heard you. I got it. No, you don't got it. She's the one that gets to check that box if you got it. You don't got it until she says you got it. And then the fourth and final piece of this is boundary. 
you've got to be able to negotiate space, rules, what likes, do you like likes and dislikes, like Facebook, like this, don't like this. To be some degree of negotiating where the boundaries are in a relationship. God has created boundaries. It's like, you know, I love the idea of God's graciousness, and I believe that the reason that we don't change is because of a lack of grace rather than a lack of rules. However, I do believe that you can be too grace-oriented by not having boundaries. You know, in fact, theologians call too grace-oriented antinomian. Now, how's that for a nice $16 word? Antinomian means against the law, that you're against boundaries. And we've got to have boundaries. There is rules to play by. So with that diagram in mind, encounter with God is what we're talking about. I've got three questions for you. So grip your pen a little tighter and respond to these three questions. First of all, the first question in order to, to create a listening grid this morning is what circumstance or relationship is most troubling to you this morning? <clears throat> what relationship, what circumstance is most troubling to you? And again, I continue to have challenges on the home front in my family. Again, it's not as bad as some, but it's enough to disrupt me. Um, when I call my wife on Tuesday night and she's crying and my wife is not a crier, that's not good. She's just reached her emotional limit. There's no margin. And my wife is tough as nails. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the girl in the relationship. She's the man. You know, I should wear kilts. I would feel more comfortable, you know, with a skirt on, you know. Um, and when my wife is crying, that's not a good thing. That is a troubling thing. I want that to be resolved. So the second question that I would ask you is what do you believe is the solution or the resolution for that issue? I just want you to be honest with yourself. What do you believe is the solution to that circumstance? Just be honest with yourself. And if you say, y'all just need to be tougher. Y'all need to quit belly aching. I have some open slots in my schedule next week. Be glad to see you. That's probably not a good response, but I want you to be aware of what's going on in your own heart. Um, and in many ways, I don't know what to do about some of the situations that I'm dealing with. I don't know. I I feel so helpless. Some of the situations going on um, in my life, I, I don't. I'm I'm at my wit's end. I don't I don't know what to do. I really don't. But I want you to be aware of that. And then thirdly, just as kind of a practical application, and this question will make more sense as we go along this morning. Is what would be the don'ts? that you know that you need to live by in, in relationships with people that are most significant to you? What is important for you that you don't do? Write down three don'ts. Don't. Don't say that. Don't do that. Write down three don'ts. For example, when I call my wife Tuesday night and she's crying, what I want to don't do is don't tell her to quit crying. That would not have been good. When your wife's crying, don't tell her, don't cry. Texans don't cry, sweetheart. Big girls don't cry. You know, it's like the caption uh, on the guy in the hospital. He will survive, but it will be a long recovery. You know, that's what would have been in, un, under my picture at that point. Guys, there's so many things in our lives. 
have an easy answer, an easy solution. Um, we want that. We want to fix it. And the Bible's very clear that God is not about fixing, but he is much more about intimacy and relationship. And when we get that through our heads and quit trying to get out of tough times, but to learn how to cling to him in the midst of tough times, now I want you to turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 is kind of the passage that we're going to work with this morning. Ephesians chapter 3 is such a powerful passage of getting through difficult times through an encounter with God, an encounter with intimacy. Here's this young church at Ephesus and their leader has been thrown in prison. Paul's in prison. It's like, you know, how many, all these churches get started and Paul keeps getting thrown in prison. It's just like everybody's scratching their head like, dang, you know, how are we going to get on with this movement of Jesus when our leader at this point gets thro keeps th being thrown in jail? And Paul keeps saying, you know, that's kind of the way God's working the plan. What you thought was plan B has been plan A all along. So listen in verse 11, it says, <clears throat> and this is proceeding along lines planned all along by God and then executed in Christ Jesus. Once again, he establishes this has been the plan all along, all along. When we trust in him, we're free to say whatever needs to be said, bold to go wherever we need to go. So don't let my present trouble, which is being in jail, don't let my present trouble on your behalf get you down. Be proud. Now, he moves into then instructing them. And Paul is writing to them in the midst of those difficult circumstances and what's he going to say to them? All right, now, make sure you do these three things. Check on this. Check on that. You know, make sure of this. You know, what would you say? What would you do in your male try-to-fix-it mode? What would you do? Listen, listen to what the Apostle Paul says to them in the midst of, you know, everything just falling apart. This is like bad. The leader's in jail. My response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. Get down on your knees. Get down on your knees. Ask him to strengthen you by his spirit not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. What Paul invites them into, and it says in your study Bible that you'd be strengthened in your inner man. He didn't say anything about external circumstances. He goes right to the heart. He says, he's basically saying to them, Get your heart right. Keep your heart right. Work on your heart. Work on your heart. Work on your inner man. Develop your inner man, and all the external things will somehow take care of itself. He does not give them the three things to do, the 16 things to take care of. He doesn't give them a checklist. He wants them to be strengthened in the inner man. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, that you'll be able to take in with all Christians the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience. Reach out and experience. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. And that's his instruction on how to handle difficult circumstances. Wow. Encounter with God. But Paul, what about this? 
but you'll be strengthened in your inner. But 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 you don't know that person. How? What about that guy? Be strengthened in your inner man. Y yeah, but but you don't understand. I may lose my job. Be strengthened in your inner man. The need for a personal encounter with God is absolutely critical. <clears throat> And guys, the question that we typically ask at Deer Camp, and those of you who have been Deer Camp know that we use this question a lot. Understand how important it is to work with this question every day. And the question is, where are you? See, you you are in Christ as a Christian. I, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're a, a Christian. Now, that's a dangerous assumption on my part because you need to understand that you may not be a Christian. But I'm going to assume this morning that you're in Christ. You are adopted into God's family. You have the divine life in you, the Holy Spirit. You are loved and accepted in Christ. You know about the things of Jesus. And yet at another level, you don't know them. You don't grasp them. You're still dogged with bad habits, often anxious or bored or discouraged or angry. You may have many specific problems and issues that need to be faced and dealt with through various specific means. You're in Christ, but you're living poor. Your experience of what you know is incongruent, is what we call it. Yeah, I know those things. I believe those things. Are you experiencing those things? Where are you? And, and the apostle Paul is saying in that passage, man, I want you to experience in the midst of this difficult circumstance the richness of feeling the love of Jesus. It's the idea of the failure to move truth into your heart. You know, you know the truth, but your heart doesn't feel that affection, that intimacy, that connection. It's never really changed who you are. That is tragic. And the Apostle Paul is wanting to make sure that these confused Ephesians really experience the power of being loved by Jesus. Um, as Joe mentioned, next week is deer camp. Next weekend. Um, if you've never been, I want you to sign up. If you've been, come on up. You know how that works. Here's what some of the guys have said. Uh, this is some just quotes from the November, January, and March deer camps. Deer camp is a great place to have a connection with Jesus. There are so many broken men that are willing to be there for each other. I like the trust you can have to say anything and know, know that it's a safe place. Leave all your fears behind. The men's coaching weekend has made me become a better husband, father, and lover of Christ and myself. I learned that discovery is a process, not an event. This is where I found hope, grace, and joy. Most importantly, community where I can be myself and grow intimately. I decided to attend the men's coaching weekend because I've heard so many stories of life change. I heard I had a real encounter with God in this place. The openness, love, community, and brotherhood of sharing here will set you free. <sighs> Men's coaching weekend taught me that there is no need to be insecure due to my past life. It has validated my thoughts of needing a strong faith in community. I had the ability to help others by sharing my story, which resulted in real relationships being made. It has completely opened my eyes to another way of living healthy. I learned to trust God at Deer King. You don't have to come already fixed. 
I used to think that I needed to be a better person before attending, but I learned how to just be real. I had a desire to grow in a close group of guys that can come to know me as I am. It's a great place for Christian brotherhood. Guys, I've got pages. I could sit here and read this all day. Uh, it's changed my life. Um, Blaise Pascal, when he died, they discovered um, that he had uh, sewn into the, to the lining of his coat an experience, an encounter that he had with God that changed his life. The lining of Pascal's coat read like this, quote, in the year 1654, Monday, 23rd of November, half past 10 in the evening until half an hour after midnight, fire, fire, he wrote. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. and not of the philosophers or of the learned. Certainty, certainty, feeling, joy, peace, unquote. Pastoral encounter with the living God. Guys, circumstances aren't going to change necessarily. Those people are going to be in your life for a long time. But we desperately need to know Jesus' personal encounter. Not know about him, but to taste him, to feel him, to experience him. And that requires that your heart and emotions are in sync. If there is no feeling, there is no healing. If there is no feeling, there is no healing. A spiritual experience in the inner man is what Paul is talking about here. Your heart is changed. We're not just talking about giving lip service. The heart is the center of both your personal consciousness and your most fundamental faith commitments. If the truths you know about Jesus have failed to change your heart, then you have only given mental assent to the idea of Jesus' love for you. You continue to seek love through popular or cultural avenues or old styles of relating. There's no change. A changed heart is required. In that passage, it talks about that we that the Apostle Paul says that I want you to grasp the love of Jesus. The word grasp or comprehend means to get a secure hold on the truth. If you're exposed to the light of the Christian truth that is holy, that, that God is holy, and if the Holy Spirit has sensitized your heart, then you not only respond with emotion, with tears or trembling joy, but you permanently change the way you live and behave in the world. There, there's actually change. When your feelings and behaviors are affected, you have to a degree grasp a particular truth about God. The light comes in and makes permanent impressions. You've experienced it. You're not just giving lip service to it. It's like, wow. Jonathan Edwards. Somebody get me a Kleenex back there. My, I'm going to have to wipe it on my sleeve if, if you don't. Thank you, Clay. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Edwards tells a, a great illustration, simple illustration, which most good illustrations are simple, about honey. You know, everybody knows honey is sweet. You know, it tastes like honey. Kind of like those, you know, tastes like chicken. Everything tastes like chicken, you know. Tastes like honey. Everybody knows that honey is sweet. Even before you eat honey, you know it's sweet. But wow, when you put it on your 
tongue and you roll it around on your tongue and then you say, wow, I knew honey was sweet, but now I really know it's sweet. That's what being strengthened in the inner man is about. I know every man in this room, I believe, I, I, again, I'll assume that you know that the answer is always Jesus, like squirrel, answers Jesus, you know. What has four legs, fuzzy tail, climbs trees, and little Johnny goes, well, I'm in Sunday school, so I'll say Jesus, because the answer is always Jesus, <laughs> you know. It's a squirrel, Johnny. It's okay. But the answer is always Jesus. But do you really feel that? Have you tasted of it? Oh, I know it's sweet, but it's really sweet. Guys, that's what I need this morning. That's what I want. I want to be strengthened in my inner man. I get tired. You get tired. I get discouraged. You get discouraged. I feel alone. You feel alone. I feel overwhelmed. You feel overwhelmed. I need to be strengthened in the inner man. And part of this idea of being strengthened in the inner man is moving God from this sort of bigness to this intimate understanding of a daddy. That's what scripture invites us to, knowing the father. It's the idea of kneeling, as the apostle Paul said there in, in Ephesians 3, just kneel before the father, daddy, Abba, father, daddy, I need a fresh dose of love. I need help. You know, many of us still have our dads. I have an 89-year-old dad. I love talking to my dad on Sunday mornings. I usually call him on Sunday morning. I talked to him last Sunday. You know, talk about the weather, talk about the book that he's reading, talk a little bit Tennessee football, even in March. Um, Abba Father. Got to have the Father. Guys, I want to show you a clip that is a powerful, powerful clip. I love the movie The Green Mile. It is the gospel. It is so powerful. I don't know where Stephen King stands with God, but I do believe that he, at, at the very least, he understands the gospel on an, on an intuitive sense. He understands that there's God be a redemption even in the midst of evil. And as he writes the Green Mile, as he gives us this story, he gives us a character that is Jesus, John Coffey. Most of you have seen the Green Mile, the big guy, John Coffey. John Coffey, J.C., J.C., John Coffey. He is a type of Christ. We know he's innocent. The story unfolds. He's innocent. Everybody knows he's innocent, but he has been charged, and now he will die innocent. There is a humility about him, and when you see this scene, I hope it moves your heart, not to just engage the story of the Green Mile, but the story of the gospel of how an innocent man died for you and for me. No greater love does a man have, does a friend have, than to lay his life down for his friend. I pray you'll be moved by this. Watch this. Roll on one.
grasp the deep, deep love of Jesus. I hope you're moved by that scene, but I hope it takes you past that scene to how it symbolizes an innocent man dying for us. <clears throat> and that the Apostle Paul, in the midst of difficult circumstances, just simply points those that he loves toward being strengthened in the inner man. That's all. I just want you to be strengthened by having a personal, intimate, feeling, affectionate, heart, felt experience with the living God. And just in case we don't get it, Paul gives us a little bit more detail. Look there at the end of the passage, and he talks about the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. He's trying to expand our vision of Christ. Now, there's no way to know exactly what Paul meant by these phrases. <clears throat> and so I can only conjecture. I can only guess. So I'm going to offer you my interpretation. You, you, you meditate on this passage. You may have a much, much better perspective on this than I do. But I think when he talks about the breadth or the width, <clears throat> he's talking about the love of God is wide enough for you. I don't have time to read all the passages, but they're there on the back of your notes. Revelation chapter 5 talks about that one day every knee will bow and that everybody will be included, all races, tall people, short people, skinny people, fat people, all colors. I just think that is so cool. I think that's so cool. And that defeats all prejudice. There's no room for prejudice. Just knock it out of the park. No prejudice. All are included. We will all bow the knee. Can you grasp that? Everybody. I mean, all this ethnic stupidity is ridiculous. No. All inclusive. Then he talks about the length. What, what, what does he mean by the length? The hand of God is never too short to reach down and grab you. The length of God's hand, there's no distance that can separate you from God's love. John 10, verse 11, very clear. My sheep hear my voice. No one can snatch them out of my hand. It's my hand on you that makes all the difference. Philippians 1, verse 6, he's going to complete the work that he began. So I think that that idea of length attacks all sense of abandonment. All of us feel abandoned at times. In Christ, you're never abandoned. You're never abandoned. He's always long enough to reach down and touch you. The height. God's going to give you the same thing that fills his heart with infallible joy all through eternity. There is no limit to how high that his love goes. No limits. High as the heaven. High as high can be. High as the universe. No limit. No limits. And then finally, the depth. Think about how deep Christ had to go to redeem you. He gave up a seat by the Father. He gave up equality with the Father to humble himself and, and come down to earth. And then if that wasn't an earth, uh, enough, the years he spent on earth, he ascended into hell during his three days in the grave. There is no depth. There is no hole that Jesus would not go into to pull you out of. There's no hole deep enough. Not going to happen. I pray 
that I have a fresh encounter in my inner man. I need to be fed internally and stop concentrating on all the external stuff around me. That's how you live the Christian life. It's from the inside out. Now, just to close, just some practical. And each week I've tried to give you just some practical pieces over here on the don't. How you're engaged, anchored with our heart. If we're going to do this intimacy thing, we've always got to keep defaulting back over here. And now just practical steps in intimacy. And you've got a list there. Now, what I would invite you to do is, I'd, is I, would, I would go through this. I would complete this. And I'm not going to have time to develop this uh, at length. But what I would do, now that you've got the don'ts, is I would go to your teenager. I would go to a friend. I would go to your wife and say, sweetheart, do I do this? don't do this I shouldn't don't you know don't do this Phil said do I do this now again as I've often said to you don't ask the question if you don't want to know the answer first thing is don't accuse you know you you how many times in the last two weeks I'd, 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 I'd love to ask my counselor buddies Russ and uh, Ron and others of Kevin and others of you that are uh, counselors, how many times have you heard in your counseling office bickering and fighting about the finances? You spend too much. Dude, I love that kind of stuff. I make a living on that. <clears throat> you know, keep accusing your wife of spending too much and keep coming back to my office. Don't accuse. Work it out. Don't tell your partner what she should be feeling. Again, Tuesday night when I call my wife and she's crying, well, you shouldn't be feeling that way, sweetheart. Dude, I'd still be trying to catch my breath if I said that to her. Don't give advice. Don't judge. Don't guess at your partner's motivation. I tell you, if you're trying to resolve some kind of conflict and you're going to do it by questioning somebody's motive and why they did it, hmm not going to happen. Don't be sarcastic. Oh, I'm not sarcastic. You're sarcastic. Don't use hard to understand private jargon, you know, making little side jokes, even while you're trying to resolve something with somebody. Don't say you really don't understand me. Wow. You don't understand me. Boy, that, who made you judge of what your wife understands? And don't call your partner names. I did a wedding this past weekend in Fairhope, and one of the things that I typically put in the in the wedding ceremony is don't um, use humor at the expense of your mate. You should never have to apologize for making uh, fun of your wife or embarrassing her in public. Don't do that. You know, figure out some other way. You know, tell a knock knock joke or something. You know. Don't do that. Guys, um, I need your prayers. I need to be strengthened in my inner man. Um, it is good for me to be with you this morning and, and to read from the scripture. I want to be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged. May you be strengthened in the inner man. Lee? Uh, <laughs> thank you, my friend. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this man. We thank you for Bill and giving him his time, his talents. Lord, bless him, bless his family, keep him safe. God, you know what's needed in Phil's life. 
our lives, each of us here in this room. Lord, touch us as only a father can. Help us to kneel and ask you to work afresh in our lives. God, may your Holy Spirit enter this room, every man's mind, transcend your thoughts to the action that you want each of us to portray and say as we walk and talk like your son Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. sense that it that the building has been under attack for a good while and always is. Thank you for the way that you've used it and what you've done as you work for England and what you did in the Ten Rings Square. Help us do this work. Give us all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to us right now. We believe that. We claim that. We uh, in your himself is, is not empowered to, to handle it, but you are God. And so we raise that up, we raise up your law of protection, we raise up your Holy Spirit uh, to work in the hearts of your people, and all the emotional healing is the good thing, physical healing, all the spiritual healing is the good thing. And so we Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brothers. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Joe. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.